So welcome to this great international audience attending the first in a series of webinars on the shock of the record, archives and truth. The series is sponsored by the British Records Association, a charity that promotes the preservation, understanding and accessibility of our recorded heritage for the public benefit and by the Institute of Historical Research, a constituent part of the University of London School of Advanced Studies, which is celebrating its centenary year with a multiple series of interdisciplinary partnership seminars that address issues of enduring historical and topical importance. My name is Alice Prohaska. I'm a historian and archivist with a background of running archives, research libraries, and academic organizations in Britain and America. And I'm one of the group who've designed this series on the shock of the record. I'm here to introduce our first webinar in the series, which we are calling The Shock of the Record, Why Archives Matter. First, a few words about the purpose of our series. There's a worldwide crisis of misinformation in what we might term an era of post-truth. Cynicism about public sources of information is rife. We need to know what we can trust, how to evaluate the information that's produced in a proliferating range of forms, from traditional print to broadcast and social media, and of course, digital in every form. And it is served up often without any kind of mediation by an infinite number of organizations and individuals. This is where archives can help. Records held in public and private archives can provide the evidence we need about the sources and potential biases of information and a means of testing and comparing the veracity of what we read. This series will shine a light on the importance of archives and the people who use and curate them. In this first seminar, we are extremely fortunate to have brought together three immensely distinguished experts and they will go in the following order in which I'm introducing them. Professor Sir Richard Evans, former Regis Professor of History at the University of Cambridge, as a renowned historian of the Third Reich, amongst other topics. His most recent book is The Hitler Conspiracies, The Third Reich and the Paranoid Imagination, which grew out of a leverhulme funded program that he led on conspiracy and democracy. David Ferriero is the archivist of the United States, appointed by Professor Obama and confirmed by Congress. He has held this post since 2009, following a career at the head of some of America's and the world's leading research libraries. Daniel Finkelstein has long experience both advising and commenting on UK government policy at the highest level. In addition to being a member of the House of Lords, he is a columnist for the Times newspaper and he's currently at work on a biography of his grandfather, Alfred Wiener, who founded the Wiener Holocaust Library in London. Our three speakers will each speak for 10 minutes or so, following more or less straight on from each other. And after they've all finished, they will form a panel presided over by Jean Seaton, who is Professor of Media History at the University of Westminster, the author, among other things, of Pinkos and Traitors, the BBC and The Nation, 1917 to 1987. And she's also director of the Orwell Prize for Political Writing. We expect a lively session of questions and comments. Please direct your comments to the chat room, which will be moderated behind the scenes by Professor Jane Winters of the University of London School of Advanced Studies. Also behind the scenes and responsible for setting up and hosting our series are Julia Shepherd recent past chair of the British Records Association and Amanda Engineer, the association's secretary. You can find the chat room button at the bottom of your screen and there will be captions for those who wish accessible from the CC closed captions button also at the bottom of the screen. The webinar will last for one and a half hours in total. It is being recorded and in due course will appear on the Institute of Historical Research's YouTube channel. Our Twitter handle is at shock of record. The next webinars in this series will be on evidence under attack on the 17th of June and truth and trust with special reference to oppressive regimes on the 11th of November. 
When I wind up at the end, I will say a bit more about how you can register for these events and suggest some possible ways of following up and encourage you to join the British Records Association. But now, without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker, Richard Evans. Richard, over to you. Thank you very much for inviting me to the seminar. Uh, it's a great privilege to take part. And uh, I'm sorry, I muted my initial words. Um, I should be experienced by now, we all should be experienced by using this technology, but somehow it always seemed to go wrong in my hands. Uh, I'm a historian, I work mainly on Germany. So most of the, almost all of the archives I've used ha have in fact been German archives of many kinds, national, local, regional, private, um, institutional, organizational, all kinds of different, different archives. Uh, and I put up uh, at the beginning of my talk on the screen, uh, a document or a couple of three documents really, one of which is a, uh, a picture of Hitler, one of which purports to be a photograph of Hitler in Argentina in the 1950s. Uh, it's not, of course, needless to say, it doesn't even look like him. And the third of which is uh, an FBI document, which is often claimed to provide proof that Hitler escaped the bunker and underneath the Reich Chancellery, where he, in fact, shot himself uh, at the end of the war, on the 30th of April, 1945. The FBI had uh, a duty to record any reports of sightings of Hitler. Everyone was aware of historical parallels, particularly Napoleon uh, going off to the Isle of Elba and coming back again. Stalin encouraged this, an early example of deliberate Russian misinformation, I think. Uh, and so the FBI uh, logged all of these reports, but they invariably found that they were all false. Uh, however, conspiracy theorists who argue there was a conspiracy to deceive the world by putting doubles or identical people in the place of Hitler and Ava Brown in the bunker uh, and spiriting Hitler away to Argentina where he and Ava Brown and in some versions Blondie the dog uh, lived a happy and contented life afterwards. Now, apart from the implausibility of this, the idea of Hitler being content to live on in obscurity, uh, whereas he spent his entire life uh, uh, in, in uh, fanatical commitment to political the politics of Nazism, uh, the, uh, there's uh, evidence of, there's a lack of evidence as were the, the argument from silence, Eva Brown, the end of his life, Eva Hitler, and they married his companion, was a professional photographer who uh, photographed and uh, with homemade home movies of their life together up to 1945, no photographs or home movies uh, discovered after that. And the archive, the archive has the, uh, the testimony of the people who were with Hitler in the bunker, those who survived, including the two men who uh, uh, burnt and uh, destroyed the bodies of Hitler and, and Eva Brown after they'd killed themselves. There's a Russian investigation, though that was uh, kept under wraps for several decades, uh, came to identical conclusions with the British investigation by Hugh Trevor Roper, later an eminent historian, who uh, of course rather blotted his copybook towards the end of his career by authenticating the fake Hitler diaries. Now that is also, uh, uh, of course, uh, interesting because it was very easy to prove they were fake. They were printed, uh, they were written uh, in ink and on paper that dated from the 1950s, long after Hitler had uh, departed the scene, long after his suicide. So why then uh, do the conspiracy theorists, and there are so many of them now, the internet is awash with conspiracy theories, some of which are taken seriously by the newspapers, by the media. There's even a 24-part TV series about Hitler's supposed escape uh, to Argentina, his life there afterwards. Why do they, why do they ignore this evidence? Uh, and this is, I think, rather a, a, disturbing, uh, a disturbing finding, a disturbing fact that the conspiracy theorists really don't uh, trust what they call official evidence. They don't even bother to consult the archives. Uh, they simply declare, and you'll find this, for example, in the, uh, uh, in the um, 
uh, television series, Hunting Hitler, they simply declare that we've all been fooled. There's no real evidence that Hitler killed himself, which is absolutely not true. You can go to the archive and, uh, and find it. Uh, you can go to look at the records of the German court investigation in the mid 1950s, which ended by certifying, by issuing the death certificates because of various property disputes involving Hitler and massive evidence is compiled. But conspiracy theorists know, in inverted commas, the truth. The no, they know they're right and that the what they call the official record, official historians, is wrong. And in some cases, this is even uh, justified, they even feel justified in presenting forgeries, uh, adding to the official record. Conspiracy, uh, one conspiracy theorist who believed that Rudolf Hess, the deputy leader of the Nazi party, who uh, flew uh, on his own to Scotland on the 10th of May 1941 uh, with what he imagined were peace terms. Uh, there's a huge amount of evidence that uh, uh, Hitler was shocked and surprised by this. Everybody was surprised in, in, in Germany, but that's ignored. And one conspiracy theorist who believed there was a conspiracy either by Hitler or by a peace party in the British uh, Conservative Party, a non-existent peace party, I should say, uh, lured him over, even planted forged documents in, uh, in the National Archives files on Hess, which of course, again, were quite easily, easily discovered. So um, conspiracy theorists, I think, as it were, ignore the written record and ignore the archive. They have a deep seated belief in their, in their rightness, but they can be found out. Archives are very big. They have huge quantities of information, far too much to be digitized. You actually have to go to most of them in order to find out uh, what you're looking for and uh, look at the examine the, the documents. And there are new archives, there are new, new material being added to them all the time. Just to take one example, I was asked by the British Academy to write the bi uh, biography, a, a kind of obituary, a lengthy obituary for Eric Hobsbawm, the historian, who's a fellow of the British Academy. Every fellow gets an obituary. Uh, so I went to his house and there, I found an entire room piled sky high with documents, files, boxes, an enormous amount of, of material. And on reading some of it, I thought, well, this is really very interesting. He had an interesting life in many ways and it's all there. So I decided to write a full length biography. That stuff uh, had only become of course available on his death in 2012. Or as a historian of German Nazism, um, Goebbels, Joseph Goebbels, the, uh, the uh, Reich propaganda minister, uh, a rabid anti-Semite uh, and thoroughly nasty man, in fact, um, he kept diaries every day. The last volume of those was only uh, published just over a dozen years ago. Alfred Rosenberg, the self-styled ideologue of Nazi uh, Germany, the Nazi movement, his diaries were discovered and published in full only in 2015. So material keeps on being added all the time. Uh, it's almost overwhelming. Uh, and the archivist's job, of course, is a very difficult one, is to order it, decide what to keep and what not to keep, uh, decide uh, how to present it, and then uh, make sure that it's, it's made available. There's a problem there, because quite often archives, archives are, or archival material is, is, is destroyed for one reason or another. Uh, for example, the British government in the 1950s decided to destroy uh, a lot of records of British atrocities in the colonial wars, in Kenya, the Mau Mau uh, treatment of the Mau Mau uh, insurgents and to uh, uh, secrete a large quantity of the rest of it uh, in an archive to which people weren't allowed access. We are uh, talking a lot about these days about the cancel culture and the suppressing of the past, but that's something governments do as well. Governments destroy archives, destroy materials. Again, from my own work on Nazism, uh, the Gestapo, the feared secret police of Hitler's Germany, destroyed huge quantities of their own material to avoid incriminating themselves at the end of the war. Fortunately, uh, a handful of towns uh, in a handful of towns in Germany, they were not able to do that. And so we can reconstruct some of their history at least from that. 
But it's not just political reasons, of course, that impel people to destroy archives. Uh, it's uh, often the feeling that they're not important. And as a historian, my instinct is to say, it's all important, keep it all. You, you never know uh, when it might become important, when uh, the nature of what is written by historians, uh, fashion styles and, and tendencies change. Again, I can talk from my own experience. Um, in, uh, in, in the 1980s, I worked in the state archives in Hamburg uh, and uh, I, I found some secret reports of plainclothes policemen before the First World War for about 20 odd years before the First World War, going into working class pubs and bars and coming back and reporting about what people were talking about just to figure out what the working classes were, were thinking. Uh, and so I asked if there are any more of these from the files that I've seen. And yes, there was. There was a whole roomful uh, of files labeled worthless reports. Uh, now, if any archivist had had the instinct that well, they're worthless, let's get rid of them, they were quite wrong because by the time I came to look at them, uh, there's enormous interest had grown up in uh, working class history, what the German workers before 1914 were, were thinking. Were they revolutionary? Were they uh, reformist? Uh, were they loyal to the Kaiser? And uh, I decided to spend two or three years going through these reports and uh, compiling an edition of them, which I think gave a much more complex kind of uh, uh, view of, of the German uh, working class and their thinking, their political attitudes than had been uh, current before. So archives are really important. It's difficult to forge or falsify them, at least in the long run. We never know quite what is in the archives and what's going to be, what's, what, what's, uh, what is important about what is in the archives, what material is important, what is not. So as a, as a historian, I'd say to archivists, please preserve everything you, you, you possibly can. You never know when it might become important. And if we're dealing with disinformation and uh, fake news uh, um, in the post-truth era, then it's very important, I think, to maintain records which we can use to uh, refute the conspiracy theorists, refute people who are telling lies and fantasies and say, go to this, go to the material. Don't just say it's all official and therefore it's false. Go and have a look for yourself. That's it, I think. It's about 10 minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. That's a, that's a wonderful start. I'm going to now turn to David Ferriero and ask you to give us your take on this topic. Thanks, Alice, and greetings from Pennsylvania Avenue here in Washington. I've selected a photo from the more than 43 million in our holdings. It was taken in August of 1935 in the White House garage where War Department records were stored. That was just three months before the National Archives opened for business and graphically depicts what the first archivist of the United States, Robert Connor, faced when he began his work. While the need to do something about the records had been discussed for centuries, it was not until the 1930s that those discussions turned to action. In a wonderful letter from 1791, to a Philadelphia printer, Thomas Jefferson raises his, his concerns. Time and accident are committing daily havoc on the originals deposited in our public offices. The late war had done the work of centuries in this business. The lost cannot be recovered, but let us save what remains, not by vaults and locks which fend them from the public eye in use and consigning them to the waste of time, but by such a multiplication of copies they shall place them beyond the reach of accident. I like to cite, cite Jefferson as the father of digitization activities to expand public access to records in his multiplication of copies remark. So from our earliest days, access to records was on the radar screen. Franklin Roosevelt signed the legislation that created the National Archives, hired the first archivist and served as cheerleader and more importantly, enforcer of new ways of handling the records of the country. Roosevelt was passionate about our history and its documentation. In dedicating his presidential library, he articulated his vision for that facility and for the larger National Archives, which it was joining. He said, the dedication of a library is in itself an act of faith. To bring together the records of the past and to house them in buildings 
where they will be preserved for the use of men and women in the future, a nation must believe in three things. It must believe in the past, it must believe in the future, it must above all believe in the capacity of its own people so to learn from the past that they can gain in judgment in creating their own future. Monumental statues at the entrance of this building I'm speaking from declare the message, study the past, and what is past is prologue. From the very beginning, our charge has been to collect, protect, and encourage the use of the records of the federal government so that the American people can hold their government accountable and learn from our past. And our success in accomplishing that depends on the reliability of the information captured and preserved. While technology has vastly changed the record keeping landscape, it has also challenged traditional record keeping procedures, processes, regula regulations, and laws. Our work is guided by two laws enacted by Congress, the Federal Re Records Act, which covers the 275 agencies and departments of the executive branch of government, and the Presidential Records Act, which covers records created at the White House. The latter has been described as a gentleman's agreement between the White House and the National Archives. The only teeth in the law is the requirement to consult with the archivist of the United States before disposing of records. The Federal Records Act, on the other hand, gives the archives more authority over the agencies in creation, review, and fulfillment of record schedules and records disposition. And it gives the National Archives authority to inspect the operations of those agencies. So after almost 12 years on the job and three administrations, let me share with you my concerns about our ability to guarantee the validity of the information we need to be capturing. Or said another way, these are the things that keep me up at night. The past four years have been years of disinformation, misinformation, fake news, and over 30,000 lies from the White House according to the Washington Post count. Cybersecurity threats enabling the removal or alteration of records challenge our ability to guarantee authenticity. The, the use of social media accounts without record keeping features has caused havoc in terms of capturing records. Technology is outstripping and has forever regulation and legislation. We're constantly playing catch up. The Toothless Presidential Records Act, as Jill Lepore in a recent New Yorker article, is, is an example of this inability of keeping up with what is actually happening. The federal government workforce is made up of political appointees and career civil servants. Career civil servants are the responsible for managing the record keeping activities in the agencies. They are overseen in most cases by career appointments. There are 4,100 presidential appointments in the, in the agency. So there's, there is potential for, for loyalty to the uh, uh, agency rather than to the country in terms of what is captured and what is not captured. Keeping up with reports of faulty record keeping practices, the use of private accounts and services, servers, White House staff taping together torn records. These are examples of issues that we deal with on a regular, have been dealing with on a regular basis. Recognizing and correcting bias and collecting and describing records is, is, a, is a real issue. I recently launched a task force on racism and one of the subgroups of that group is, is dealing with description, looking, at, looking exactly at this issue of perhaps systemic bias in the way we collect and describe. We have major challenges dealing with records because of the over classification problem in this country and the freedom of information backlogs across the executive branch have caused delays in, in years worth of delays in terms of access to records. And the COVID-19 situation has just exacerbated that, that backlog situation. I cited the Federal Records Act and the Presidential Records Act 
there is no Congressional Records Act and there is no Judicial uh, Records Act legislation. So two branches of the three branch government do not have legislation co covering their records. And the overriding issue is the priority and support of record keeping across the, gov across the government. Record keeping isn't sexy. Future generations will judge how well we respond to these changes. Eric Foner in his important book, Who Owns History, sums it up for me. He says, history has always has been and always will be regularly rewritten in response to new questions, new information, new methodologies, and new political, social, and cultural imperatives. But that each generation can and must rewrite history does not mean that history is simply a series of myths and inventions. There are commonly accepted professional standards that enable us to distinguish good history from falsehoods, like the de denial of the Holocaust. Historical truth does exist, not in the scientific sense, but as a reasonable approximation of the past. But the most difficult truth for those outside the ranks of professional historians to accept is that there often exists more than one legitimate way of recounting past events. Who owns history? Everyone and no one, which is why the study of the past is a constantly evolving, never ending journey of discovery. And our job is to ensure that that journey flourishes. I started with quotes from two statues guarding our doors on the other side of the building facing Constitution Avenue, another monumental statue representing guardianship advises me every day that eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. Thank you. David, thank you so much for that, that very, very uh, thought thought provoking uh, talk. Uh, and now I pass on to Daniel Finkelstein. Alice, thank you very much indeed. Well, first of all, um, can I just say how flattered I am to share a platform with such a distinguished cast with with Jean, uh, obviously, but also with David and Richard. And it was fascinating to listen to your talks. What you see on the screen now is a picture of my grandfather, Alfred Weiner, but I don't want to start uh, with that. I want to start on a boat called the Gripsholm as it headed into Ellis Island in February 1945. Uh, and uh, it carried on board a large number of wounded American soldiers and prisoners of war. Uh, Americans who'd been interned uh, by the uh, Germans uh, and a small group of people who had been imprisoned in Belson concentration camp were being, were being swapped uh, with, um, with Latin American uh, Germans. And these uh, people included three young girls who had an urgent problem to solve. They had on them uh, their father's German First World War medals, and they were worried that as they possessed a Paraguayan passport, uh, which suggested that they weren't uh, really supposed to be there, that the Paraguayan passports had expired and weren't really uh, true uh, documents, uh, and they had these German war records, well, uh, they might be considered to be spies. And actually, um, they weren't wrong to think that, uh, due to work that uh, David will be pleased to know I've just been doing in the National Archives in the United States. It was, in fact, uh, the subject of quite a lot of debate in the State Department as to whether or not people who held these Paraguayan passports might be spies. But the reason I tell you that story uh, is because one of the three girls was my mother, uh, the other two were all my aunts, uh, and they carried with them the First World War medals of my grandfather, of Alfred Weiner, whose picture you saw. Uh, and when uh, Alfred was told what they'd done with his First World War medals, he was upset. And when I was told this as a young boy, I thought it was really quite extraordinary. Why on earth would he want anything German, uh, let alone a few pieces of metal that suggested he'd once fought for them? And I discovered the reason as I began to understand him. Well, one of them was because he was proud of being a German, but more relevant to our discussion today is that he believed strongly in the power of truth. That really was his life's work. Uh, and um, the vindication of this belief in the power of truth uh, was only ahead of him. Uh, it's understandable that at the moment when he discovered his war medals had been disposed, he felt upset because it was a denial of those two central bits of his being, his Germanness and his belief in the power of truth. Well, let me tell you how uh, his belief in the power of truth played out. I'm going to talk about the creation of the Wiener Holocaust Library, Alfred Wiener's life's work, in five stages, each of which I think illuminates something about 
archives. The first is uh, that uh, in um, 1928, uh, after the uh, far right had begun to perform very well in local elections and Alfred had begun to perceive a demographic pattern uh, in that he decided it was very important for him to build a, uh, a, a, a sort of a resource that would tell the truth to the German business elite, to the uh, German political elite, uh, and to the German public about the conspiracy theories, uh, misconceptions, uh, and lies that were told about Jews. Uh, and in particular, to note um, the organizations and groups that were sending those things. So he created something that became known as the Bureau Wilhelmstrasse, a secret effort by German Jews, uh, funded by all sorts of sources, um, to uh, Jew mainly Jewish sources, uh, to provide uh, support to a propaganda efforts to persuade Germans of the truth about what was happening uh, to the uh, to the Jews and what might happen to the Jews and the rise of anti-Semitism. In the end, it had hundreds of thousands of uh, documents, and Alfred's job was primarily to go round the country, visiting uh, business meetings, chambers of commerce, political meetings, showing these documents, showing pictures that have been taken of anti-Semitic road signs, uh, showing. Uh, local newspapers that had been produced with anti-Semitic articles, explaining what might happen, uh, and he couldn't get people to believe him. Uh, but he was able to demonstrate the truth of what he said because of the material that he had collected. However, uh, by 1933, uh, his office had been uh, invaded by uh, a German secret police. He'd had a meeting with Goering that was extremely discouraging, let's put it that way, uh, and he had to move to Holland to create uh, the Jewish Central Information Office. Uh, during the, the, that period, between the Wilhelmstrasse effort and the effort in Holland, they lost almost all the documentation and he had to start again in Holland. But quite rapidly, he began to build up once more a, an impressive archive. And that was uh, beginning to service some of the uh, Allied, um, some of what would then later become the Allied nations, but also the German underground resistance uh, with information about what might happen and what was happening under Nazism. In particular, in 1938, he created a very impressive record of what had happened in Kristallnacht, a very important event in our understanding, as Richard, I'm sure, uh, can explain much better than I, in, un in helping people understand uh, the Nazi project towards the Jews. But uh, he was unable, of course, uh, to prevent the uh, continued rise of Hitler, and it led him to have to bring the library to London in 1938-1939. And he reopened the library in London in 1939 on the day that war broke out. The reason why this is important is that the Britain was about to go to war with a country it didn't really understand. It didn't understand uh, which groups were which uh, among the Nazis. It didn't understand what any of their insignia meant. It didn't understand who any of the main characters were. Uh, it didn't understand uh, what their rhetoric meant. Um, when Rudolf Hess uh, carried out his uh, voyage to London, his secret visit to the Duke of Hamilton, and arrived uh, in Scotland, there was a widespread feeling among the media and in government that Hess was a moderate who was on the level about uh, what he was um, uh, trying to negotiate and perhaps somebody that could be an intermediary. And the Wynn Library was able to show that in fact he was an ideologue and a bit of a crackpot as it turned out as well. Uh, and um, they could have that information on ministers desks by the next day at four o'clock in the afternoon. This was a critical piece of work, but not the only one. As Jean will uh, tell you, it was, uh, the library was also very important in helping the BBC with its coverage of uh, German activities, with helping uh, from Alfred's base in New York through much of the war where he could get papers from Latin America in helping uh, the American war effort as well. 
uh, the, the fourth uh, part of his uh, journey was uh, creating the Wiener Library after the war. It was very difficult uh, to, to uh, keep it going financially. It didn't have uh, the same uh, resources that had been provided for it by uh, governments during the war, by the Ministry of Information. Alfred had to scramble for money. But during that period, I think he did do some of his most important work. Because if you look at records of the Nuremberg trials, you can see that it was primarily document driven and the prosecution teams had to understand what the documents meant and how they related to each other. The Wiener Library was, was important in that understanding. And it's one of the reasons why the documents were actually given, one copy of the documents of all the Nuremberg trial documents were given to the Wiener Library. And if you want to discover the original confessions of the Nuremberg defendants signed by the defendants themselves, that document is in uh, the Wiener Library. And then there was the final uh, stage after the Eichmann trials, after Nuremberg, after the Reitlinger final uh, solution book, this, the current Wiener Holocaust Library. What's interesting about everything that I've said so far is that Alfred Wiener wasn't creating really an archive. He was actually creating a political propaganda and understanding service. The archive was almost a byproduct of two things. One is the necessity of evidence to prove his point, and the second, his own reverence for printed word. And that's the reason why uh, he, he created it in that particular form. But obviously, once he had died in 1964, the Holocaust began to retreat a little bit into history, uh, but also begun to uh, come forward in people's understanding of history, uh, because during the war it had been much less well understood as perspective was gained, uh, the library became a proper archive, uh, and uh, it's gained a lot from its last uh, three or four heads in terms of its professionalism. It has turned what was a kind of higgledy-piggledy. I was fascinated by David's original slide. The Wiener Library wasn't quite as chaotic, but it had some chaotic elements to it. Uh, the professionalization of archives, uh, for all that David has said about the challenges that face it, I think um, people like him have done an amazing job. I was just talking to him about my own work uh, in terms of uh, digitizing information so that it's much more easily available. And just to conclude with an example of why archival records are important. My uh, mother had a nanny called Betty uh, Levine. And um, in 1943, when the family was arrested, Betty hid in the family home and didn't come with the stormtroopers who'd come to arrest the family. Uh, they took my family to Vesterborg and then to Belsen, but Betty disappeared. Uh, and uh, I knew her much later in her life as Betty, who lived in Nottingham, a state registered mental nurse, um, apparently just an ordinary person. Well, the library recorded her life story. Uh, and I don't suppose anyone's had a look at it, but now for the book that I'm writing, I have. And it turns out, unknown to my mother, Betty was living a double life. By day, she was Betty Levin, my mother's nanny. Uh, but by night, she was Joe Bosch, a member of the resistance uh, who, um, who was selling uh, resistance newspapers, uh, who escaped from the Gestapo uh, by climbing out a window, uh, who escaped uh, from a bus going to Vesterborg, who hid in an attic, uh, who survived the war in an extraordinary way. And her story simply wouldn't have have been available if it wasn't for my grandfather after the war asking her to tell her stories. It wasn't available in any other way. My mother knew Betty very well, we'd stayed with her, but my mother's version of her story was, um, you know, the story of a child's uh, recollections and it wasn't accurate. My mother's sister, who was a bit older, her story was slightly at variance of my mother's and it wasn't accurate, but the library has an active testimony which it's kept and which I could find because it's now been digitized uh, and I think by itself that story would have been lost to uh, to history an extraordinary personal story if it weren't for archives thank you thank you thank you very much indeed all three of those talks are absolutely riveting um, I'm going to hand over to Jean to manage a discussion I see we've got some really interesting questions coming in already and just as a reminder please send them to the chat button if you if you will. Jean. I mean I just thought that was absolutely wonderful because it went from the personal stories to the use to the the challenges of being an archivist as it were the challenges of being one of the grandest archivists there can be. Can I just ask you just one one very quick question really about legislation which is not where I expected to start but um, David raised the issue of legislation um, without legislation without the the statutory tools, um, governments, governments 
can be not held to account. And I was looking quite recently at some of the changes that are happening around the statutory regulations in India, for example, which are quite alarming. So I wondered if, if any of you, perhaps we might start with Richard, you know, what, what should we be doing to ensure that our, our, the legislative framework for the holding to account a government is adequate? Unmute yourself. There we go. Uh, well, I'm not a lawyer. I, I'm, I'm a user of, of archives. I'm not somebody who um, is really involved in, in um, their management and preservation. Uh, one thing I would say is that I think archives need to be properly funded. They're very often the lowest priority of, of any government. Um, when there are cuts, they often fall upon archives. Uh, a long time ago now, I was involved for example, in a campaign uh, to try and stop uh, some very damaging cuts which are being proposed in the funding of the Hamburg State Archive, which is was, uh, where I'd spent a lot of many, many happy months uh, in years uh, digging around in the files. So I think that's the first thing, that, uh, that there has to be proper funding for archives. There has to be proper and adequate regulations that prevent the disposal of embarrassing or unwanted or inconvenient or uh, uh, materials or even um, materials that, as I said in my brief talk, uh, archivists find uh, at the time not particularly important or, or interesting. So I think funding is a, a key thing and I think obviously regulations must concentrate on preserving the record and that's particularly difficult, of course, in an age when so many records are digital. Uh, and, and no longer written. I mean, it, you know, if you're, uh, as somebody who's worked on the 19th century, one of the most exciting things you can, can happen to you as a historian is you come across a little piece of paper that says burn after reading, um, and whoever has done it has not bothered to burn. But that's a really different question when you're thinking about digital records. David, what's, what, could you give us some hints about where, where we should be looking for improving our legislation? Sure. Um... I, I described the, the Federal Records Act, which is the most structured um, control system that we have that, uh, that oversees the executive branch agencies and, and departments. And that spells out um, what the responsibilities of the agencies are. They all have records managers. They all now have senior agency officials responsible for records management and they work with my staff to create record schedules. And that's all, that's all prescribed by legislation. Um, the Presidential Records Act, which I, which I also mentioned, doesn't have that same rigor. And in fact, just Monday, this past Monday, the House of Representatives passed or introduced legislation to provide a beefed up um, language in the Presidential Records Act that it starts to mirror some of the Federal Records Act um, processes, which would, which would improve the, um, the capture and retention and um, attitude around records in the White House as records. So there, but, but okay, so that's just the executive branch as, an, as, as I said, we don't have parallel situations for Congress or the judicial branch? Um, there's a set of questions, thank you very, very much. There's a second set of questions coming in, um, which are really around digital. And I think we should just go, we should just grasp that. Um, there's a whole set of questions that people are putting in about, uh, you know, how do, we, how do we maintain the digital record? How can you, I know archivists have been grappling with this for years. Um, the, the fact that lots of stuff is held in the iCloud. I know that, for instance, the National Archives have been doing some really wonderful work on making sure that people can't tamper with it. Um, uh, <clears throat> what would you do about the digital? What are you doing about the digital? Um, it, Peter Hennessy once inserted into the civil service code the requirement to print stuff out <laughs> on the grounds that at least bits of paper um, survive. I think there's a, I think there's an actually another different historical issue, which is that in the old days you could see arguments about a policy 
developing over paperwork and in amendments. And now actually because of FOI, a lot of that I think is, is less transparent than it used to be. So what would we do about the digital? Can I, can I just, uh, I can't answer the question in the way that, uh, that David or perhaps Richard can, but I do have a sort of user's perspective um, that we are of course there are new challenges um, which are which are represented by the ability of people to change things uh, whether we can track the changes and and uh, uh, that have been made in the past and that sort of thing but on the other hand um, I was just explaining to David that for my um, for my book I've been able to access records that first of all physically would be very difficult for me to access it'd be very expensive for me uh, to go there I don't know it, it'd also be an investment of time which would be very speculative. If I got there, I might travel all the way there and discover that the material isn't really useful to me. Uh, I wouldn't be looking in the right place, all that sort of thing. Uh, Digitalisation has helped immensely with that. Secondly, the search facilities mean that I've got a bit more control. I can search lots of different things to discover them without necessarily bothering somebody. So therefore the overhead, uh, it, you know, those people can be employed doing something else other than help me. Um, with documents that turn out not to be quite relevant to what I'm looking for. Uh, there's an awful lot to be gained from um, from these uh, digital um, recordings. And I, I've also been engaged in one archival project, which I hope will be of value eventually, which was to uh, 55 hours of, of tapes of David Cameron when he was Prime Minister, which I conducted personal interviews with him. And they're his personal possession at the moment. That was the arrangement. But, but ultimately, they will be available uh, historically. Um, again, uh, without that kind of, uh, they were all digitally recorded. Without that facility, I don't think they'd necessarily be available. Um, they're, they're, they're a modern contrivance. So there's an awful, I think we can bemoan some of the uh, threats and problems that it causes. Uh, but David, with his magnificent picture that he showed us, shows us that uh, there's an awful lot to be said for the state in which we've got our current archives. I'd, I'd just like to, to add, um, I'm not up to date with the most recent legislation, but there is um, an enormous amount of work going on and that has gone on. And David will be able to tell us uh, about the United States, um, which, uh, legislates for the preservation of digital material. But one of the most important things to remember, and this is just reinforces what people have been saying about the importance of supporting archives and archivists, is that there's no point digitizing vast quantities of material unless you can provide the metadata, that is the pathways through, so that people know what where the archives originated, can assess their veracity or otherwise, and just find the subject matter that they need within them. And this is, I think, um, and maybe David would like to comment on this, one of the huge challenges that I don't believe we're anywhere near cracking yet. Well, um, and I think, um, I don't want to throw the word nostalgia at you, but you're talking about you're talking about going from paper to digital and what we're grappling with is now years of digital only, no paper equivalent. And so your, your comment about print to, print to paper from a digital, uh, from a, a paper, uh, from a, a digital record was exactly the situation, our guidance um, not too long ago here in the United States. Every agency, and this is true in your country also, is shifted from paper to almost all electronic record keeping. So there is no, there is no paper, paper equivalent. And our, our guidance, our records management guidance, the record schedules are, have from the very beginning been media neutral. So it doesn't matter whether it's paper or electronic, it's the same kind of process in terms of what's captured and how long it's retained in the agency and when it gets delivered to the National Archives. I mean, can I just um, say uh, that, that we're concentrating a bit too much on the official record. Um, mm -hmm. uh, politicians uh, and, and governments are often as concerned to uh, uh, obscure uh, what they're doing as they are to uh, leave a record of it or if they do leave a record of it they leave a record that they want posterity to uh, to believe and and to enhance their posthumous reputation 
But we've got to remember that at the same time, quite an extraordinary number of politicians are writing, they write diaries. Um, they keep a daily record of what they're doing. And there are many other people who are keeping private records. And of course, the job of the historian is to match all these up, bounce them off each other and come up with, with a view and, and, and with an argument. Uh, it's not just the official record, very important though, though that is. So in a way, private records of similar, of, of what's going on in government are just as important. And of course, on a much bigger scale then, when you turn to social history, economic history, uh, cultural history, private records become even more important. Uh, archives, a fairly recently founded German diary archive in Emmendingen, for example, which is just a local initiative to collect people's diaries initially, now become a really big major kind of enterprise, privately funded, uh, staffed by volunteers and so on. But that kind of thing is very, is really very important. Um, I can't resist asking David, uh, have, do you preserve the record of Donald Trump's tweets? Yes. Good, I thought you might be. Even the deleted oh, ones. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> um, I, I mean, if I round up, I'm trying to round up some of the really excellent questions um, that are coming in. Of course, uh, one of the things is that uh, when people put stuff into archives or when things are found in archives, they, they don't know what's going to be interesting in the future. Um, I, if you see what I mean. So one of the really interesting things about archives, um, I am <coughs> with uh, the Lady Die interview, which has been a cause here. And of course, people put things into an archive then. Um, uh, so archives are like that. And of course, there's, you know, the Imperial War Museum's collection of diaries. So there's the social as well. But all of that still raises the question which lots of people are asking, which is that, it, it, at this moment, uh, when um, uh, there is a lot of misinformation, and Richard's most recent book really does put together wonderfully the way in which people fabricate and believe, for, for a number of reasons, um, myths about the past, um, and they do, uh, and that's much more available, and they often do it out of evidence, they don't do it out of nothing. They, I mean, you can say they do it out of causes, but they also construct Lego, Lego's great stuff, great fabricated stories, which have got lots of evidence in it. David, when you look at the conspiracy theories that are running in America, are you archiving those conspiracy theories? We're responsible for government records. You know, it, if, unless it was created by a federal agency, we wouldn't be collecting it. Would anybody? Well, I mean, I can try and answer that. I mean, it, it is extraordinary the, the how many voluntary associations and bodies there are across the world that are dedicated to collecting material uh, that's not in the official record. Um, for example, uh, sometimes just individuals. I think Alfred Weiner is a, a classic example of this. Nobody said you've got to collect this material. It was his idea and it was a personal, personal collection for personal reasons, which has now become a major uh, a major archive, the leading art Holocaust uh, archive in, in the UK. Um, and that's true of many other things. I know there were there were associations and groups that I'm familiar with in Germany that have collected a lot of ephemeral material from 1968, the student revolt, the uh, pamphlets and posters, all of those kinds of things. There's, uh, there, are, there are collections of, of, of ephemera. You'd be amazed what people, what people collect and, and, and archive. So I'm not too pessimistic about this. Can I just, uh, uh, this is sort of slightly at variance, but I just wanted to mention it. Um, what, uh, what, some while ago, I made a decision that I was going to try and collect a letter from every prime minister. Um, uh, and um, I was astonished at how cheaply it was possible to obtain such things. Uh, so that um, it is more expensive to buy a an autograph of Tommy Cooper, uh, the comedian, than uh, to purchase a letter from Robert Peel to his son. Um, and um, the uh, extraordinary um, variety of these things available through reputable dealers, which have included things like uh, appointments to the Privy Council signed by both the King and Neville Chamberlain, um, available for less than £150. Um, the, uh, 
suggests to me that at some point in the past, we didn't collect all this material very well and that there may be room for um, some sort of uh, reckoning about where we keep kept all our historical records about prime ministers, uh, because um, I, I, I think we've been immensely careless uh, even before we come to the informal material. And um, the, the United States, since Roosevelt really, has been much more impressive in the way that it's set about with these presidential libraries. I know that it's then with Nixon and Trump come across particular problems about the control of presidents of their own material and things like that. But it's but it may be better than what we've actually succeeded in doing, where some of this material has been really haphazard. And we're, we're about to come to the 300th anniversary of uh, prime ministers this year uh, of Walpole. And I, I, I think it might be a moment for us to consider the state of our record keeping of prime ministers. And also, by the way, um, almost everywhere you might think of visiting physically of theirs is gone. Uh, and anybody who wants to do this on this call, please go and visit Walpole's house. Uh, there's a big historical discussion about whether Walpole was a crook who skimmed money off the top. Um, anybody who goes to his house knows that he did. Absolutely. <laughs> um, it's just impossible to explain in other in any other way um because it's just unbelievably ornate and expensive um and uh we've lost a lot of information by the way that we've looked after our records in the past and so i do think there may be uh a a a task for us to revisit some of this um can i can we just go back to this thing that's running i think all the way through it which is that when I mean, richard mentioned the book is is that there's a variety of truths, but history, historians have procedures. David talked about that, um, the way in which, you know, that, that, you know, there are procedures, there are methods that mean that this gray interpretation, not the nice black and white interpretation of a, of a conspiracy theory. Um, and that, how would you advocate giving that complex story, because the trouble is that real history is, is often not so, not so, it doesn't make you feel so great as if you're on an inside of a conspiracy and you really know that everybody else is wrong. How do we, as how do you as archivists who hold this, what do you need from historians to reassert that complexity of real history? Because, and is that an answer? Is it, or is it just not an answer anymore? Richard. Well, uh, um, you of course, a, a statement can only either be true or not true. You can't have two opposing statements that are both true. Um, and so the, the job of the historian, and I do think the job of the historian is to get as far as you can as the truth, at the truth about the past and to interpret it, of course, and make it understandable. Um, and and the, the limits of what you can say as a historian are imposed by the, by the archival record, by the historical record. Uh, you can argue about things, but you have to do so in a rational manner and it has to be based on looking at the evidence. The problem with conspiracy theories is that they're often self-sealing, that in other words, there's no way that you can actually, you can present someone with a document uh, who believes, let's say, that Hitler escaped the bunker in 1945, you can present documents and reports and they will simply dismiss them uh, as, as not, not being uh, credible, whereas in fact they're overwhelmingly credible. So I think that is that self-sealing character of conspiracy theories is very important. Conspiracy theorists tend, if they're criticized, to uh, argue that just to point at the person who's criticizing them and not what they're actually saying. Um, we had this in our Levy Hume funded Leave Him Trust funded project in Cambridge on conspiracy theories, where some conspiracy theorists immediately started saying, oh, look at Lord Leave Lord Him was a Freemason. So, uh, and, and you can join all the dots and, uh, and so on. Of course, that's, it's very difficult to get across the, 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 the idea that why somebody says something or who they are is really not directly relevant to whether what they're saying is true or not. You have to tackle that on its own terms. I think archivists' job, in a way, is to is just to provide a service. It is to remain neutral, and uh, it is state archivists are civil servants. And I think the concept of 
civil service neutrality and objectivity, which is now so much under fire at the higher levels of the political uh, political levels of uh, of life in in this country, um, I think that that uh, that that sense of objectivity uh, and of neutrality is a very important one for archivists to to retain. But it, it, for me, it raises the issue, and and I'm, I need to do some research on this, but that there are lots of um, American history archives around or American history collections. And, and this is a phenomenon that should be documented and collected, conspiracy theories. And I don't know if that's happening, where it's happening. I'm thinking about the Smithsonian American History Museum. Are they documenting mm -hmm. the whole phenomenon? So I made a note to myself to do a little research on that. I, I mean, if I may say so, that, that it raises also issues of what you might call anti-conspiracy journalism, a, a, a mechanism like Bellingcat, which has been completely changed how we, how it uses material. Whether mm -hmm. Bellingcat has an archive, I actually don't know, but, and yet they, they're, it's, so there's a very interesting question there. Um, there's, there's a lot, on Walpole, you might, um, I don't know if, uh, Danny has seen on the, on the subject of Walpole, Peter Barber says, I discovered by accident in the mid 19th century he'd masterminded the doctoring of his archives <laughs> and, the, and, and got his fellow ministers to remove letters and papers relating to the South Sea battle and replace them. This is the ingenious thing with planted papers. <laughs> his narrative. So he, so he does the two things that Richard says he removes one lot, but he, he forges another lot. Um, uh, that sounds like it, the man. <laughs> um, sorry, I wanted to go back to, can, can we just, can you, how would you, there's a question from uh, 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 Richard Ovenden, it's a very important one, how would you, it's a completely separate thing, how would you mobilise uh, public and political concern, both locally and nationally for archives? And what what does what does one need to do to make archives not the last thing? I know from the BBC, you know, every time there's cuts, uh -huh. um, uh, but they chuck stuff. Actually, the archivists tend to save it by putting it somewhere else, but that's another issue. Um, you know, archives are the first thing to be cut, and they and yet the thing they need. So, how would you go about? How in America do you mobilise concern? Yeah, it's a um, I can tell you that for 12 years, I've been trying to figure out ways to excite people about, about archives and using the records, um, discoveries that are made in the records as ways of, of doing that. And using, um, especially using lots of social media to, to um, share those kinds of discoveries um, and engaging other like institutions. We do a a, a Friday um, um, pub, a social media contribution of records from photos or in interesting fun kinds of activities every Friday to um, celebrate archives and educate um, the American public about what's available in archives and keep it in front of people all the time. Um, it's, a, it's a constant battle for attention. I I, I would um, say in every political um, battle, uh, I feel you're aware of my uh, theories, some of, of some of these theories, uh, Jean, but you're aware of what I regard as the, uh, the power of the give me a fiver. Um, what I mean by that is, uh, you know, when, when you want to uh, assess the political uh, impact of something, uh, you need to know who's giving the fiver and who's getting the fiver, which is uh, five dollars, David, um, the fiver. Um, and um, and uh, so in this battle, what you have to consider when you're is uh, who gains uh, from these archives and why is it good for me? Um, that's what uh, the I don't mean me personally, I mean 
the person who you're trying to persuade. Um, so first of all, you've got a number of uh, you've got a, you've got a lot of elite political support uh, of people who have direct experience of using the li of using uh, libraries and archives and who are very powerful voices. People like Richard who who command respect and are listened to. Um, if Richard wants to write an article on something, uh, people will will publish his article uh, and uh, people will read his article. And and I think um, because those people have a uh, direct benefit gained to them they are motivated to do that and they can be used and the second is doing exactly what david just suggested which is finding ways of uh, expanding from uh, that elite group that uses archives to others uh, the the, uh, the understanding of why archives matter to them um and uh so the answer to your question is, do not make this an abstract argument, um, because you will not win an abstract argument, even uh, um, even about truth or things that we all agree are important. Um, you need to make uh, archives of concrete value uh, to the people whose support you are trying to gain. So here's a, uh, I just remembered uh, a very important um, aspect of this um, advertising archives. Um, I make visits to the offices of every newly appointed House, uh, House of Representative or Senator. And I bring with me facsimiles of documents from their state. Um, we do a little research about their own history. And, and so these are really tailored document packages that I go to the office and talk to the individual new member of Congress about who we are and what we do and get them interested, excited about um, the archives, talk about, invite them to come, bring their staff for tours and, and all that kind of stuff. And I think it's safe to say that we have decorated 90% of the offices on the Hill with facsimiles from the National Archives. So when they have constituents who come in from their states to visit, they can point, the member of Congress can point to the, the document, send them down here to the National Archives for a tour so that's another way of, of advertising. And hopefully that translates into warm feelings at budget time when they're, when they're looking at what the needs of the National Archives are. There's a big question coming that's, that's come through, a lot of really very important questions, but one, Jean, I thought I'd call your attention to is, um, about educating children in using archives. And I think um, I used to, to do a bit of work with that um, on the national curriculum in history in this country. And it's vitally important and extremely effective to give children chunks of what I'd describe as raw archives to work on and to ask questions about, not the little fillets of quote unquote evidence that appear in neat boxes in history textbooks, but actually to visit a local archive or to visit the National Archives, even more exciting, um, and to see material that isn't fully explained for them, and poss if possible to see two different points of view expressed in different parts of that material. And that sort of education teaches them to ask the, the critical questions that they need to ask, which also address another question comment that we've received um, from somebody at the um, at the ICA, the International um, Congress on Archives, and that is that archives are about accountability totally. and transparency, and if the education of young citizens teaches them how to interrogate the archives in ways that I think they should be taught and aren't enough, certainly not in Britain. Um, that makes an enormous difference to the health of the body politic. I would add this, I, I, I think in that, in, that, uh, in that effort, don't forget the tactile. I was saying to David before we started uh, that going through the War Refugee Board documents, it was, immen it was immensely satisfying that the documents were were presented in a way that made me understand what the physical folder looked like. It was, it was sort of folded over and there was a folder at the beginning and a folder at the end so that I got some idea of what it looked like and I found that a very satisfying experience. When I when I wanted to interest my children in the Wiener Library I took them uh, to in the Wiener Library there was this amazing copy of Mein Kampf uh, there which had been taken by a British couple of British fascists on holiday uh, with an amazing picture inside which which um, 
which had the ama- which had a little pencil mark with uh, an arrow. Hitler had gone to sign it in Berchtesgaden, and uh, there was an arrow which said Hitler, <laughs> and then another arrow to another person which said Bormann question mark, and the third was pointing to a little girl and said Karen. It was absolutely hilarious, um, but also sinister, and you couldn't achieve. You couldn't explain the library better than with that item because it was tactile and they could see it. Anyway, the digitization has done very well in presenting that, but I think it's an important feature that people can touch history and they can understand what it's what it what it what it like originally. And that's that's part of the thrill of the archive. And why why looking at the archive can sometimes be more satisfying than a book which has contextualized the archive. Yeah, I, I think we've got some fantastic questions here and, and points. Two minutes to do it, I think. But um, one is that, um, of course, each archive is not, I mean, what's in it, any archive is the result of a selection process. So they're not kind of completely objective and neutral. Uh, and as I've said, the job of a historian in a way is to put different sources and different archives together uh, so that you can come up with a picture that is more let's say objective than it would be if you simply depended on uh, on one archive. Um, I think archives serve a huge variety of purposes and we've been talking mostly about political archives, but um, you've got family research, for example. I remember I was researching in the Hamburg State Archives, the archivist rather com- curmudgeonly a chap set up as uh, some rather ordinary looking people came in through the door. Here come the bloody family researchers again, because he hated dealing with them. But for a lot of families who are interested in ancestry, it's really, they're really important and provide an important service. Um, they, you can make them uh, um, archival material, of course, absolutely fascinating. You can go to um, a library in, in, in Cambridge, for example, in one of the Cambridge colleges, and you can actually see Henry VIII's love letters to, to Anne Boleyn. Um, you can see you, there's so many fascinating documents. Uh, and I think uh, the archivists, of course, do a, a great job in making them available. And many of them will be absolutely gripping for, for children in one way one way or another, they're not terribly, they're not as dry as people, as people think. As somebody who's taken one <clears throat> field box of a very obscure organisation that I've got the entire records of in my office into third year lectures. So I just take this sealed box. It's a very obscure organisation. The papers in it aren't very exciting. They open it as if it was Christmas. <laughs> and, and so I think, but that, begs the question of where history is in our curriculums, not in a good place, where history teaching is in general being, being, so I think there's that, I think getting at younger age children, there's a very interesting um, thing here from Belgium saying that, you know, another thing is we need people like Richard and Danny telling very good stories that, that grab, you know, we, that takes people to archives as well. The good personal stories, the good, the well-written, riveting stuff. So, you know, Caro on the presidential archives, you know, took people to archives. We need historians is, is another answer. Um, so um, can I say a few words about education? Because um, we spent a lot of time, um, given the fact that civics has disappeared from the curriculum um, for many years now, kids, are growing up not knowing exactly how the government works or or what their roles and responsibilities are, what their rights and responsibilities are. So we do a lot of um, in-person education in our facilities. We have um, a huge investment in an online facility called Docs Teach, where we have thousands of facsimiles of primary sources that teachers and students are using in the classroom with some curriculum that's been developed by my staff and teachers contribute their curriculum. And one of my favorite activities is twice a year, we do a sleepover in the rotunda of the National Archives where a hundred kids and and an adult (laughs) come and spend a night with us, um, an evening's worth of activities on the Saturday night, um, exposure to all kinds of uh, historical information and and activities, and they sleep on the floor of the rotunda in the presence of the Charters of Freedom. And Sunday morning, 
we have a pancake breakfast. I flip pancakes and they go home. And that um, is, it's just so rewarding because these kids are self-selecting. They are history nerds. They are just tingling when they arrive and the opportunity to sleep in the presence of the charters is just heartwarming. So there are all kinds of ways of getting it. It's can I uh, just pick up one of the things that uh, is in the it was, is in one of the questions I thought was very powerful, which concerns genealogical research. So one of the things that uh, drives my research on is I'm researching my own family, my mother and my father, um, and uh, the thrill of discovering things about my own family, um, e even though um, I'm doing quite a lot of it in a historical context. So. Um, uh, but nevertheless, it's incredibly powerful. Uh, and I think um, the fact that you might have information in the archives about them is very powerful. And it's amazing what there is as well. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously, I was when I went to Ellis Island, I was able to find uh, the original documents of my mother um, arriving in Ellis Island, um, the fact that she was declared to be Latin American, which she wasn't, and then it was crossed out and the word stateless was put on it. Uh, that was an amazing experience that that was there. Um, and uh, I think that that is a way of engaging people. Um, I, as I said, there are a lot of very uh, abstract arguments and some of those work with the people. That was a great story, David, about, about um, what you do. And uh, I'm very jealous of the people who get to do that. Um, but uh, the uh, pancakes included. Um, but the, uh, 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 you'll have to flip some for me at some point. But, the, but I think, but I think um, beyond that, there are a lot of people who are just very interested in their own stories. Um, and this program unit you know, we have here, which is Who Do You Think You Are? Where people go back in people's histories. Well, that is a very, very powerful. Let me just add, uh, there's an interesting question about archives and uh, enabling citizens to hold government to account and so on. Uh, we're in the middle of an argument about that at the moment with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, if there is a, a public inquiry uh, 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 of investigation uh, as to what went wrong in the UK during the first pandemic and, and perhaps later as well, um, and and why and that will depend on the archive. Okay, very recent material, um, but it will depend on the on the archive. And from that, of course, uh, if the uh, whichever kind of investigation or, or inquiry happens, there'll be uh, lessons to be learned about how to do better next time because there will be a next time. So they have a very powerful immediate immediate influence uh, and importance as well. I mean, I think that that, that that the I think one of the things we're talking about is the um, the decline everywhere of understanding of political systems, um, and that that in a way, I mean, archives can add to that, but it, they can't be a substitute for proper understanding of political systems. But I mean, I think it's a very interesting way of getting people engaged. The other the other thing is obviously that archives. It depends if the, the stuff has been the, the right. That's why I asked about conspiracies. If you are, if you're controlling the right material, that will answer some of the more important questions um, as they come out. Um, in America, there's a National History Day. That's a that's an interesting idea. Yeah, I'm glad that I'm glad that uh, Lloyd mentioned that because that is a, an incredible way of engaging students at the junior high school and high school level in their classrooms, in their history and social studies classrooms, um, engage them in research and they use um, archival materials. And um, we host at the end of the, the year, we host um, the judging for the local areas here. And then the national competition is held at um, the University of Maryland campus uh, where we participate also. It's a great uh, activity. I mean, I, I think the other the other thing it's it's very interesting. Uh, um, I've been a collected local material. One of the things everybody lives locally. They may live on the internet, but actually, you live somewhere locally. And getting to, um, you know, local government like local government archives, local history, is something that seems to me there's it's gone down again. It it rose and it's got it's gone down, and that's part of the loss of the local. 
which is a actually a really important aspect of how we understand ourselves. Um, I don't know what's happening in America. Is America live locally? I think differently, as as, as it were. I was I was um, I was thinking about this um, conspiracy theory, the rise of the conspiracy theory, the embracing of conspiracy theories, and the decline of civic education. A lot of the misinformation, disinformation is around um, uh, for many issues has to do with the um, lack of understanding of the separation of powers. The president saying he can do such and such, but he doesn't actually have the authority to do that. And because kids and it goes back to their parents also don't understand the separation of powers either can't can't push back and say you don't have the authority to do that you have congress is the only one who has authority to do that so that um i think just just builds on the, the um conspiracy theory embracement Chris, can you say anything else that we should I mean, can I just go back to the question of trust in the archive? It seems to me we've dodged around a bit because um, archivists try and build trust in the archive, um, but people may not trust the archive. D d d d d so in a way you're, you're the holders of the propriety of holding the archive, um, but I think we're looking at people disputing the archive much more is there anything that can be done about that? Well, <clears throat> there are, I mean, I had, uh, well, over 20 years ago now, I had to um, act as an expert witness in a case involving allegations of Holocaust denial yeah. uh, against the writer. And um, I, I think it's very important to counter Holocaust denial by presenting the evidence as much as one, one can. And there are websites that, that do that. Uh, there are endless numbers of books, very authoritative books, based on archival material. Uh, there are facsimiles of uh, original uh, material, whether it's of plans for um, extermination facilities or uh, documents by those uh, the perpetrators and by, by, by the victims who survived. Uh, there, there are many different ways of getting at, at, at the truth about the extermination of six million Jews by the Nazis in the Second World War. Um, the problem with conspiracy theorists and Holocaust deniers is they simply brush this material aside, they, they, they ignore it. Uh, they will not go and, uh, and look at it. And that, that's the real, the real problem of ingrained prejudices that will not be, uh, cannot be addressed in rational terms. I do think I, I, that is obviously true, and it's amazing to have just debates and discussions with people who are whose views are, as Richard, you know, explains, hermetically sealed. But I do think we should avoid doing what my mother always used to call only seeing the holes in the Emmentaler. Um, you know, I do think um, that the truth. We had a big thing in Britain, for example, about the anti-vaxxers, and it turned out they were actually a tiny group really um people were in favor of the vaccine and most people you know it is impossible to eliminate all um belief that archives are faked and that there's conspiracy theory and there's a there's a huge amount of work gone into evolutionary theories and game theory as to why people do that there's there's actually a game theory advantage into being in being in the 10 percent of people who don't think what everyone else thinks um and a lot of uh conspiracy theories richard's much more of an expert on this than i but i think i'm right richard in thinking that a lot of it is about demonstrating how clever they are yeah, and how yeah. stupid you are um okay. when in fact obviously the opposite is the case you you i I think um, mathematically it would be, and in game theory terms, it would be impossible to eliminate that altogether. All you can do really is to um, is to do the very best to ensure that you have it to a standard of integrity that is satisfactory and that you're trying to tell the truth as much as you possibly can. And you can't be too discouraged by the fact that some people will never be persuaded by that because I think the truth, you know, in, in reality, over the you know 250 years of the enlightenment we're winning this battle much more than we're losing it mm. which i mean on which splendid end 
I think we, <laughs> I mean, I'm, 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 I'm slightly inclined to say Richard's wonderful theatrical performance, as it were, of the, against Holocaust deniers 20 years ago. And we need more of those great events in which, in some sense, um, the, the thing is thrashed out in public. It might be more difficult to convene something that got everybody's attention in the same way as that trial did, if you see what I mean. So it's a really interesting, that's not, that seems to me another, we need, we need those events, we need events that command a lot of attention because they re-allege the importance of the archive and of, of secure truths. Um, so that's an interesting thing. I'd like to thank everybody Oh, it's been a and, and the questions which I think we're going to also archive are just tremendous. So Alice is now they're really, really and I'm sorry if we haven't been able to answer all of them. Alice. So I'm just going to wind up and um add my heartfelt thanks to everybody, Jean, you included, for a, a really fantastic session. Um, impossible to sum up everything. Um, one questioner some at some point during this session um wrote uh we, the archivists, need to stop being just quietly competent. Yes, that's <laughs> absolutely true. And this is uh, an, a, a, hopefully a step in that direction. And everything that David described about what he does at the National Archives, and I think a lot of the same sort of thing happens here too, um, is, is very much to be emulated and increased, I think. And of course, uh, we've also been reminded about the the intractable importance of all the born digital material, um, which never sees paper, of course it doesn't. Um, and it, but it also is born digital in increasing numbers of different digital formats. And archivists have uh, a monumental, a Herculean task to deal with all of that sort of stuff. Um, I think education was an important theme in this and people understanding about archives and what they can give them, whether it's their personal understanding of their family and their family background, or uh, the ability to challenge their parents or their school teachers when people assert things that aren't supported by any kind of evidence. That's cru crucially important. So I'd like to thank absolutely everybody, all of you for your wonderful questions. Um, and I hope and believe that we've provided a thought-provoking start to what I do hope will be an international conversation. Um, a recording will be found in due course through the Institute of Historical Research website, history.ac.uk. And meanwhile, do tweet using the handle at shock of record or post your thoughts and further questions onto social media of different sorts. We'd be really pleased to receive your thoughts on how to follow up this important discussion in the public sphere and plant the seeds of action on some of the concerns that have been voiced here. So please continue to watch and contribute to this space. The Institute of Historical Research website will give you details for joining our forthcoming web webinars this, in this series. The next one, Evidence Under Attack, is on the 17th of June, and the third, Truth and Trust, on the 11th of November. We're planning a second series in 2022, and we'd very much value suggestions for topics. Please also consider joining our sponsor organization, the British Records Association, which champions the preservation and public understanding of archives. Its journal, simply entitled Archives, is a great source of information about every aspect of records in all sorts of contexts. And here on the screen, you can see the website. So again, thank you all enormously and warmest, warmest thanks to our panelists for all that you've contributed to this fascinating debate and discussion. Um, and goodbye for now, but I hope we'll all meet again. <laughs>